What's up guys, my name is David Garcia. I'm the director of the music business program for Icon Collective. We're excited to bring you this conversation with Jay and Dan from the Elements Music and Sound. We cover a lot of ground about the business of sync and licensing, and also about how to get your hustle on so you can start your own successful business. I hope you enjoy, let's get right into it. So I'll give you a Our bit pleasure. of background on the, the idea for the, for the music business workshop. Um, basically, like Aaron was saying, it's, it's a reframing of, of the music business professional. Um, but the idea for this workshop is to really take different parts of the music business. For example, today we're going to focus on um, music licensing and kind of shed light, dissect, you know, take some of the mystique out of it, if you will. Um, so one of the areas that's like fascinating for me uh, that I used to actually work in is, is music licensing and sync. And so I was like, well, what better way to kick it off, um, you know, with you guys? Because there is that kinship between Icon and the elements and whatnot. So thank you for being here. Let's kick it off with a little bit of an introduction. So we have Jay Bonilla and Dan Bewick. How, how do you say that, Dan? Is you that, say it like the big right? car, B Buick. It's, Buick. It's, ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's like it's the spelling before one of us fell off the boat over <laughs> here and someone spelt it phonetically. Yeah, so. Very nice. So then <laughs> let, let's get right into it and talk about the elements and kind of like you guys' role in it and what it is. So imagine if nobody knew what music licensing was, like how would you explain that area to them? Well, I'll take this one. So um, music licensing in sync, uh, licensing overall is, you know, you can license to, to many different things, but within sync is essentially licensing a piece of music, your music in this case, and using it against a picture in some kind of media. Um, in its most basic form, that's essentially what it is. Whether that be an existing piece of music or something that you write specifically for the media, um, that's essentially what sync is. And within that hugely simplified explanation, are many sort of layers they go down to, you know, licensing of a master, which is the actual recording, physical recording of that piece of music. And then you license also at the same time the publishing, which is essentially the IP and what publishers always used to call the lyrics, the melody, and the music. Um, and so when people do covers of, say, if somebody does a cover and licenses it uh, to, a picture or to media of any sort, but it's a cover of one of your tracks, they still have to license the publishing off of you. And that goes the same for pretty much any kind of licensing across the board. But sync is specifically to picture and you can say to games as well, you know, it depends on Absolutely. what medium, when you start getting into actual, into the actual gameplay during a game, i.e. games that are triggered through uh, WYs or FMOD and that kind of thing. That's a slightly different area, but there are many cutscenes that get music get, gets music licensed to them. And say, for example, a great example of a computer game license in a more traditional sense would be the music that's licensed for um, uh, Grand Theft Auto, for example, that they play on the radio. I was just going to say that you know, there's so the the small the, the width of media now is is so wide, you know. Um, yeah. I mean, sync now can even go for a post on TikTok, uh, you know, like social, like Dan said, video games, obviously TV commercials and TV shows and films. And it's just, you know, radio spots. It really is almost infinite now, the way that music is being used. Um, well, and that's, and that is what makes it so powerful is that absolutely. in regards to if you're making music and you're not uh, syncing it, you are missing a in many people's cases the majority of their revenue stream mm -hmm. um, from initial licenses to performing rights payments this is as you should be absolutely essential to part of what you're doing as making music as a music maker and creator yeah i think up and down the spectrum now too in terms of like you know the weekend and Billie Eilish all the way down to somebody sitting in their bedroom making music, you know, there's nobody who can ignore sync anymore. Like when we started out in the industry, you know, the Beastie Boys would just be like, I was going to 
say the F word, but I won't. Okay. No, they would say no politely mm -hmm. or not politely if somebody asked them to license their music on a spot. And that kind of, that almost defined what was cool being as being a recording artist or whatever it might've been 20 years ago. It's like you were selling out if you were licensing your stuff to, you know, Kraft or Cadillac or whatever it might be. Yeah, specifically that, advertising, you should not. Advertising especially, yeah, so more, more so than TV and film. Yeah, 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 but you know, that's so wildly changed now that that's not even really a conversation that's being had. I mean, there's still some folks mm -hmm. who might feel that way, but you know, again, all the way up and down the spectrum of, of popularity of artists, everybody needs to understand sync uh, because it really is the way that a lot of people are making money and making a living, you know, um, especially in the last year with people not being able to tour you know, that's opened up a ton of conversations that we've been able to have with artists at a level that we couldn't reach before, really, as it relates to our type of projects. Everybody's down to have a conversation about working with brands, about working for advertising, you know, whatever it might be. Um, so it's opened up a lot of those kind of conversations for us. And it just has dri driven home how in tune artists need to be. Whether you got, are going to be, you know, you think you're going to be a huge DJ pl playing stadiums or you're going to be whatever, it's like you need to know about sync. Mm -hmm. um, there's just no question about it at this point. That's just the state of things. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that is true. It's, it's an amazing revenue stream for, yeah. uh, for artists. And if you're going to be managing artists or if you're going to be representing artists in any way, you have to know how to break in there. I have yeah. a question about that's a little more practical a little bit later. I want to save it. Also want to kind of save the COVID conversation because I'm interested in you guys as a company and how you were able to pivot and just sort of like, you know, stay afloat. Um, but let's go back to the beginning. I, I read on your bios that you both have a music background, like you, you come from like a songwriting and production. When did you decide, like, I'm going to make this pivot into the, the business side of things and really kind of like go that direction and create a business that has employees and responsibilities and all this other stuff? There's, there's kind of two questions there mm -hmm. because I, like uh, I came along to the elements later. But Jay and Ian had already pivoted, and in my own way, I'd already pivoted as well. So there's kind of two answers, sure. and maybe we give our individual answers as to Absolutely. when that happened, and then when we came together, and and you know, and sort of how that how that moved forward. Probably the, the best way to answer it. Cool. Yeah. So we'll, we'll go with Jay. Like, how did mm. you decide to start the elements and kind of go in that direction? <laughs> yeah. I mean, Ian and I, when we started as the elements, we were certainly we, we didn't know a thing about musical picture and we were just, we had set out to be the next Timberland and next Neptunes and, you know, that's where, where we were headed. So after about a year of starting to work together and getting some traction and starting to do some remixing for some, some notable folks and, you know, just doing some cool stuff, we just happened into music for picture. I had a buddy who was working uh, with a, pretty high profile director who had just gotten his first big Reebok campaign, first big advertising campaign. So my buddy hit me, he's like, hey, I know you guys are doing tracks. Like, why don't you send me, Ben X me a CD, if, that's, if that puts, <laughs> puts us in an era. Or a all. if you really want to. <laughs> on your yeah. age, James, on your age. Adapt. Totally. So we did that and, you know, the next, they, they overnighted it and the next day they call us and like, hey, we like number one on the CD. We want to use it on this campaign. So we're like, okay, cool. So they just, they sent us a check and, we didn't know, think anything above it and, you know, just kind of kept doing our stuff and making tracks. And, and then this started happening over the course of the year. They kind of kept coming back. It was another source of buddy that we had who we did an ESPN campaign with. And at the end of that year, it was like, what is this thing? Like, we're making way more money. This feels like a business somehow. Like, you know, and both Ian and I are econ majors and not either of us trained in, in music at all. So we always kind of had a, an angle for thinking about the business side of things, you know, so it was like, let's look into this this advertising, you know, and, and kind of music and picture thing. And sure enough, over the next, you know, several years, we just kind of put our head, heads down and really learned it. We started doing film and TV and, you know, movies and, and all that kind of stuff. And then, so, you know, to kind of, to, to answer the question in some respect, it was very much an accidental pivot. There's no question about it. And it took us a long time, honestly, to figure out how to write to picture because, if you're coming from more of, we came from more of a pop urban background in terms of our kind of musical sensibilities. It's very, you know, four bar loop, eight bar loop. You think in kind of sections and, you know, verse, chorus, and, you know, so for us to kind of have to 
making some emotional pivot to what's going on in the picture was like, what? Like, wait, that's, that's in bar three. How do I do? Like, I can't do that. That's not, that's against the rules. So, you know, we, we spent a, a good amount of time sort of figuring that stuff out and working through that and just learning how to kind of really connect with the emotion and tell a story of a visual, you know, which is something that isn't really, you're not, you're doing that in some sense, but you're not doing it in such an overt sense that you're just sitting kind of writing music that you want to write or you're writing for an artist or whatever it might be, or you're producing somebody. Um, but again, once we made that pivot, we really saw the opportunities there and, and certainly on the business side. And it felt like, you know, we had this, we had these elements come together, no, no pun intended, of being able to create this really authentic music and also being really good and responsive as a, you know, in servicing our clients. So, and that was not, that piece was not in place. Like if you were an ad agency and you were going to go to like, get a dope track somewhere from, from like a producer or an artist, the problem is they're probably not going to get back to you for two days. And then, you know, when they get up at 1 PM, they might get, you know, they maybe will send you an email after they do a few things or, you know, it just, it wasn't, it didn't have a customer service sort of oriented, uh, angle or, or consideration. And we were always really good at that. So, you know, those th things came together. And so people started coming to us for that thing. You know, if they needed that, a great sound that felt like an authentic record and they wanted to get their phone calls, you know, <laughs> returned yeah. really quickly and responsibly, we were the ones, you know, to, to come to. So that was kind of our way in. And that just, you know, really snowballed over the years. And it's a long story, man. It's, it, you know, it's, it, there's a lot of arcs and a lot of ups and downs, but that, that was the sort of the beginning of the pivot. It usually is. It usually yeah, is. Yeah, it really is. What, what about your origin story, Dan? Okay, so um, like way, 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 way back, uh, I started, there's a whole load of other stuff, but I started like doing rave music like back in the day and ended up getting like, when I say rave, we used to call it sort of hardcore so it was all like break beats, like really early prodigy kind of sounding stuff. And that's where I started. But it was way, he was way ahead of his time. And I was, I was doing crap and went from there. And then, um, and w I set up, I managed to get a manager and I got signed when I was super young to a little publishing company and got a little bit of money and bought a four track. And, and now I'm aging myself right now. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and, and started doing stuff there. And then I pulled that equipment with another guy who had an obsession with analog equipment. And so like we opened up this little studio and I would engineer for these guys. I mean, there's a couple of record shops down the street. So people I would meet in the record shop because I started DJing with a guy as well. Uh, we started throwing illegal raids and that kind of stuff. And the people that we'd meet when we're picking up records, they say, I say, oh, well, yeah, I have a studio. Oh, I want to make a record. And we charge them like a hundred pounds for the day. And, and then um, I sort of ended up pivoting from that into sort of house music. and. Uh, I did that for many, many years. And like in the nineties had like a load of success with that and had remixed all kinds of artists and had number ones and, you know, gold discs and all that kind of stuff. And then I had some personal stuff go down in the early two thousands. And I was like, I, I can't do this. I was like DJing all over the place and I was still DJing. And I was just like, I'm not getting any love from this anymore. I've got no drive for it. So I took a sabbatical, took a year out. And then in 2001, 2002, I came back and I was like, I'm going to write music for sync because that's what I've always wanted to do. I applied to UCLA, believe it or not, to do film direction and got accepted. Um, obviously, you know, about 150 years ago now. But uh, I come from a single parent family and they said, oh, yeah, that's like back then it was like $8,000 a semester. <laughs> my mom was like, this is amazing, but I haven't got that money. And I was like, yeah, neither have I. So that never happened. So through, I was writing music already. So like the whole direction thing, I was like, if I can write music for pictures, then that works out better. So I opened another studio and then opposite that studio, uh, an ad, a music, ad music company opened up um, in London. And this is the early 2000s. And now, I was the only recording studio in this huge building. And they like knocked on the door one day. I said, hey, you making music? And I was like, yeah, what do you do? I said, I, I, I was ghosting still for a ton of uh, house producers, uh, house artists. And I was DJing all over the place still as well. But less under my own moniker, I was just like doing gigs. What was your moniker? I'm interested. 
Uh, I was a dirty rotten scoundrels for a long time. That, that that's that's the one that sort of a lot of people knew. Was that from. Speed Garage? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, we did a lot of people sort of. It was more. I mean, you know, it was kind of Speed Garage, and then we Speed Garage, as we called it in the UK, right. and then we yeah. went like Todd we went Edwards, like Todd Edwards and, kind of vibe. Ish. I, Todd's a really good friend of mine. Do you know Todd? I've met him a few times, but I have a lot of your records probably because I consider myself a house head as well. So oh, I, hell no. Yeah, yeah. Oh, dude. Okay, right. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, yeah, totally. So, we were remixing everything, man. So, so, so you know, so it was me and a guy called Matt Frost. And um, like I said, we parted company in about 2000. But then I started working around that time. I did a couple of feature films. I really wanted to concentrate on that. And that kind of that just developed over time and then in about 2013 or something a few years ago 2012 something like that i ended up meeting up with andy carroll and i was already doing music for advertising already obviously and uh and and the films throughout all of that time through a friend of a friend met andy and it turns out andy was one of the main people one of the partners of a company called amber music back in when I started really sort of doing music for advertising mm. back in the early 2000s. And that company were my were our, our arch nemesis because they won <laughs> everything. And if you lost out on a, on a spot, probably to Amber Music. So anyway, me and Andy met up and we just ended up getting on so well. We got together with some other composers and uh, set up a little business just doing music for advertising and whatever we could get our hands on. But me and Andy always kind of bonded the most and it was me and him who were bringing in most of the jobs anyway and sharing everything. So. We kind of ended up splintering off, and that's where really I I was like, oh, I've kind of done a lot of advertising, and I'd just done a feature film for Lionsgate. And in 2015, I came to LA because I had meetings with sort of like the big film composers, and I was I was financially secure, so I was just like, look, you know, I just want to come and shadow you guys, and you know, and and do that. And whenever I was over here. I would always meet up with Jay because we'd actually, I feel like the story going all over the place. We'd actually met 10 years prior to that through my old publisher in mm. just a random meeting. So whenever I was in LA, I would come and have a cup of coffee with Jay. And in 2015, I came over to tell him that like, uh, yeah, yeah, I'm thinking of sort of trying to spend a bit more time over here and do some feature films and stuff. And then we ended up sitting down and Jay was like, hmm. You know, you've been throwing jobs backwards and forwards across the pond for a while now. You know how you roll. Do you want to think about coming and sort of doing something here? And I was like, you know, at the elements. And I was like, ah, that wasn't my plan at all. You know, <laughs> you know, the plan was to go and do start doing feature film music. But uh, you know what? You know, let's just see where it takes us. And that was six years ago now. Best day of Dan's life. <laughs> but my, or the worst i'm, I'm, I'm sure. 20 i'm 26 by the way this, this, this like, yeah. he's aged 40 years this, in the I last you know, what, I, six years. we look we look back at a, at a picture of all of us in our first at the office that we first all got together oh and i should say because me and andy were doing stuff i was like hey andy come on i met these guys called the elements we should you know let's kind of all get together they, they're down and they know you from the Amber days as well. And so that's how we all got together, like back in 2015. But I was looking at a picture when we got our first office all together, and like we're just putting this, this decal on the wall, and we're all like, <laughs> we all look so much younger. And it's yeah. only been six years. Uh, like, oh <laughs> wow. Damn. So is that Damn. is that why you guys have the two offices, the LA and the London? Is is that yeah. Okay. Because Andy, Andy looks after London. He's he has family uh, over there, and I ended up dragging my wife and my dogs over over here, which is kind of where we wanted to be anyway. So, uh, so I want to dig into the the business of the elements a little bit. Um, when Jay, when you were talking, you you talked about customer service being one of the main focuses of like your business. <laughs> Is that kind of like you, your, your, what they call your unique value proposition? It's just the ability to kind of get back and really manage the customer and the customer expectations. Because one other thing that's really interesting that I think is a subsect of what you were saying was, um, I think the ability to communicate with a client, maybe because you are a producer or you came from that background, gives you a little bit of an edge from someone who just doesn't have that vocabulary. Yeah. 
Yes. I think that that there's no question that, you know, trying to, it's not even just, you know, being responsive because that's anybody in our business should be doing that, but it's really about teaching, you know, and, and modeling for our team that tries trying to delight really, honestly, to use a sort of a cheesy word, you know, I mean, when we go through a project, a lot of these projects that we do are really complex. There's a lot of moving parts. They tend to last, you know, a few weeks, months, whatever it might be. It's going through a real journey with a client, you know, and, and they're entrusting you with some pretty heavy stuff, you know, a, a, a decent budget. Uh, like I said, a lot, you know, maybe there's a lot at stake for them. So the biggest thing is us making sure that they feel wildly supported at like every step of the way and that they know that no matter what crazy twists and turns are going to happen, no matter what their, you know, their boss freaks out about at some point or whatever it might be or the, the client or, you know, that we're just going to be there and we're going to be supporting them and we're going to, you know, make sure that things go well and that they're super happy with how the thing turns out. But even that's not enough because to do that and to not be able to de deliver creatively is still sort of half of the equation. So it really is the coming together of that white glove level of customer service with being able to, in our case, deliver music that sounds like records and that sounds authentic or it sounds like a feature film score or whatever it might be um, and not be dumbing it down and delivering like advertising music or jingles or shit like that you know um i think that our industry has a little bit of a bad rap in our industry meaning you know music for advertising specifically um as kind of dumbed down shitty versions of things you know what i mean so that's the real you talk about the value proposition that's really our value proposition and that's really the core of our brand is that ability to make little records you know and to really hold ourselves, hold the bar high enough on ourselves for everything that we're doing. It could be, you know, a fucking cat food spot or something, you know, um, we're still trying to make a record. We're still trying to make a hit record, whatever it might be. So that that's really the value proposition along with delighting and unexpectedly, you know, overachieving for our, our customers on a customer service level. There is a, there is another element that I wonder, I, I feel like it might have been in your question as well. Another part of a, a really important part of what we do is the business of translation and the translation of what the client is telling us and then putting it into language that the composer or producer will understand and be able to latch onto. And then subsequently after that, the, the, translating what we feel should happen in the development of that track once they've sent the full version. So the task of revisions and making sure that, that we're not speaking like somebody who don't, doesn't know what they're talking about because we all come from a background of production and composition ourselves. We feel that we are pretty well armed in a, you know, maybe not necessarily right the way down to the nitty gritty of what you should be doing in Ableton, but everyone has their own processes, right? But certainly musically being able to articulate whether, how something should sound, how it should move musically. And then if something needs a bit more bottom end, you know, saying it needs a bit more bottom end, hey, give it a bit more sparkle, you know, we have that, we have that knowledge because it's completely in our DNA from where we came from. Um, so that is another part, uh, aside of all of the administration that goes along with all of those things as well. Um, that is the sort of people part of kind of what we do primarily. Yeah. And you oh, guys but, are, you guys are clearing the deals also, right? You're doing both sides. Yes, we are. Yeah. We're taking care of all the admin for, you know, the, the, every project, well, basically, whether it's a license. We have people. Our, our, the <laughs> yeah. Staff, yeah, is, is, the um, businesses. Yeah, so it's, you know, about half of our business is original composition and mm -hmm. about half is licensing of existing material catalog. Um, and within that also, we're doing music supervision where we're finding records, you know, out of the world, maybe huge records by big artists, maybe they're looking for something breaking, you know, whatever it is. So that's kind of the part of the licensing side too. But we, we also do sonic branding as well. 
which we've done quite a lot of over the past couple of years. So yeah. sonic branding is is a whole topic unto itself, but essentially making logos, mnemonics as they're called, that, you know, you see the little, the, the, the most obvious example of that is Intel Inside or HBO, that, you know, that's a mnemonic and more and more companies want them as a brand, Sonic brand identity. So we also create them and everybody always goes, oh my God, it's like three seconds of music. That's so easy. Oh, hell no. We, <laughs> we spent with one client a year, or was it 18 months just developing them? It was, well, it was almost over a year. A year. Almost, almost a year, year, yeah. Massive amounts of research and yeah. You know, I mean, science and yeah, there's, there's yeah. so many elements of that side of things. Yeah. yeah I was um, going to ask like, what, what's the research like on, on the, I noticed the sonic branding part and what is the research that goes into that stuff? That's <laughs> Jay. <laughs> that's all you yeah. Know. Yeah. I mean, it's, it, it's pretty deep, you know, I mean that the, the one that Dan's referring to the project that he was referring to was with a massive client, they didn't have really any experience doing sonic branding in the past. And it was also started out as a competitive job where we were competing against another company to try to get the job. So especially because of that, I mean, <laughs> I think on both sides, us and the other company, we had to sort of pull out all the stops, you know, the stakes were big, uh, in terms of, of landing a gig. So, you know, we worked with a scientist from, uh, a, a neuroscientist who specializes in, you know, the, music's effect on the brain. And, and we, you know, did a whole presentation with her. We really um, did. Yeah. And we, <laughs> we really did. Yeah. Yeah. And, and also there's a company called Veritonic that we use. It's a really interesting company. They specialize in like qualitative measurement of music and sound basically. So, and they have an AI sort of driven part of their platform. And then they also do like focus group type testing with, you know, playing people different sounds and getting them to score them and all that kind of stuff. So they were a part of that, the process. They, they were there with us, you know, for the presentation because we knew we wanted to test whatever the Sonic logo was going to be. We wanted to test it thoroughly before we put it out in the market to make sure it kind of was doing what it needed to do. Um, and then there was also just a bunch of market research. We need to know everything about the brand. We need to know what, how the brand sees themselves. What's their position in the market? What are their competitors doing? I mean, it's a gazillion things, man. And so, you we know, this to, stuff is all being. We spoke to staff who worked there who had nothing to do with marketing. We yeah. interviewed, you know, yeah. Uh, yeah it was for a beverage company. Can't say so what we, they were, but people who yeah, worked yeah. in the factory. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. We, I mean, it was, it was crazy. You know, historians of the brand we, we yeah. interviewed. And, wow. yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah. it was, I mean, that's the, the depth of which some of these projects can, can go, you know. So it's pretty crazy. And then it ends up being, you know, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Seriously, this one, if you, yeah. if you totally. have heard what, where we went, where we started yeah. and what we ended up with, yeah. like in this particular, this particular one, you go, yeah. Oh, wow. We brought, wow. we brought universal music in with us on the original pitch too. Um, they're the side of their company that works with brands and, and sort of brand partnerships. And, you know, they, they came in with a big vision of where we can take the music to, for the whole brand kind of after the Sonic branding project. And, you know, it, it, it was, it was crazy. So, yeah. Wow. You mentioned that half of your business is, is music licensing. If I'm repping an artist manager and, you know, if I'm in a position where I'm representing artists, how do I go about pitching you guys music? Like, is there a submission process? Is there specific things that you guys look for? If this person is organized, this is cleared, you know, all mm -hmm. that stuff. Um, yeah. Yeah. Go, go, go ahead, Dan. Okay. Right. Well, I was yeah. just going to say there are many, there are many things that you look for. If you're, you know, if you're a manager, we have, first of all, we have a non-exclusive library. Okay. Okay. And it's, it's actually great for us we often say you know send us your existing music that you know doesn't have a lot of ties to it because sometimes we need to turn this stuff around quick um and we'll put it in our existing library and it means that it's all not exclusive and so it'll get pitched out to things you know instantly mm -hmm. what that also enables us to do is really get a gauge on where your sweet spot is you know if you're sending us a bunch of music and it's all you know trip up or something or it's all you know future bass whatever we can go okay this artist is really great at future bass and you know 
if you're managing, for example, we'll probably turn around to you and say, okay, we've got like a job in future based thing. It needs original music. And because we've been able to zero in on that, you know, it's an original base. It's an original music job for future base, but it needs a lot of scoring. Okay. So then we come to you as the manager and say, how is this person, you know, are they organized? They're reliable. Do they take two months to write one track? Cause you're going to have 24 hours. Do you know what I mean? Or can they turn this around the stuff around super quick? Um, and then essentially, yeah. and that's how we approach, uh, um, artists as well. They need to be organized. They need to have your ducks in a row. You need to have all of your stuff recallable. Anything you sent to us, you send to us, make sure that you can go, okay, give me 10 minutes. I'm going to bring it back up and I can change it, alter it. Um, you know, you should have your session should be in straight. Everything should be the days of having like a jam jar full of data. It just, it's just. That that doesn't yeah. doesn't cut it if you're going to get into business of of music proper. You know? I think brevity and organization are really important. Yeah. If you were a manager and you're reaching out to us, and we get people you know reaching out to us every day to kind of, they might be artists, they might be composers, or sometimes managers. And and what I love is yeah. give me a couple good bullet points of why I need to pay attention to this. First of all, it's like mm -hmm. maybe they've you know they got written up in such and such article. Here's a link and whatever. And then obviously a really clear, concise link to some of their best work you know i mean there's times we'll we might even meet with a manager or something and you know we come to the end of the meeting and it's like yeah so like you make sure we get, get send us some stuff where we can really get a feel for the artists that you represent and uh you know get a feel for for what you have and it's kind of like oh cool like okay let me i'll go put that together or you know it's like that's what you should that's you know that should be step one yeah exactly just have a nice little dossier that you can easily pass along that isn't you know TLDR and it's really concise yeah. and I just get and it right away like oh I see I see what they're keep doing it here. realistic all right mm -hmm. keep it realistic in regards to like you know we come to you with a spot and like people see dollar signs they're like oh yeah you know that track's gonna be like 40 grand for that and it's just like oh, okay catch you later all right that's a good you know, that's, that's a good point yeah yeah there's a there's a, a, a pretty big label uh, management company that we've gotten to know over the last exactly couple of years. Exactly what I was about to say. Yeah. And, and they're, they are a dance based, you know, EDM based. Mm -hmm. And it was super dope because when we met with the, their, their kind of main dude there uh, a couple of years ago and, and sort of started the relationship, he was really straight with us and super realistic. He's like, look, I know that our genre, these artists are amazing. They're some of the best around, but this genre just doesn't sync. We just don't get a lot of syncs. So if you got something, we're ear, we, we're all ears. You know what I mean? It doesn't have to be six figures to, to sort of walk in the door type of thing. It's like, just hit us up and maybe we can make concessions. Maybe we can make things work. And so that's the, that's a great basis to start a relationship with a company, with a sync company like ours, where this it's not, person, you're not coming in kind of like super like, well, okay, if your budget's great enough, then, you know, it's just like, let's just, you can always say no, but let's just keep the, yeah. the, the, the dialogue open and, and, have a little flexibility if possible, you know, depending and literally on the there is nobody bigger in dance music who has this attitude. And that person, it, it, it's, it's a guy, he's very well known as being sort of an innovator and you could probably guess who it is without me mm. being too ambiguous, but they were just such a great have a couple guesses. To work with. Yeah. Yeah. I will, I will shake my head at all of them, but like, <laughs> you know, super cool approach, super cool yeah. attitude. They're like, we'd call them up and we'd say, not a great budget, but here is what it is. And they just say, let me go and check. We check it out. Nothing was like, ah, oh, no, 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 we can't do it for any less than that. At no yeah. point was it, you know, was it like that? And that is from one of the very biggest dudes out yeah. there. So, you know. It's tricky because you, you want to, if you're coming from the artist side or the manager side, you know, you want to walk the line between knowing your worth and yeah, also not excluding yeah. opportunities that could lead to other opportunities, you know? So I think it's, we see people who have very different stances on those things where they come in very staunch with, you know, a very clear line of like, we know our worth and we're not doing anything that's whatever, you know, X, Y, Z. And then other people, like I said, are more just agreeable and they're down to have a conversation. And sometimes it's yes. And sometimes it's no, but I highly, highly suggest the latter approach just in and general, honestly, you know, being, being brutally frank, we rarely work or we'll continue to work with the former. Why would we? You know, yeah, we've got people just, who we can call up and say, we've got, you, you know, 
there's a dialogue there. You know, you're willing to listen, yeah. not not just not not you're just part of us. So, I don't know any any, I don't know any company or any individual that we've gone back to, you know, more than one occasion where they've just gone, no, it's this much, you know, without a really, you know, if they say, well, actually, I've just signed it to Universal, and we're like, oh, okay, fair enough. Do you know what I mean? That's a different, that's a different thing. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like building the relationship with you guys from the business professional seat or the artist rep yeah. is kind of really where it's at. It's having that conversation. It's really setting the expectation and understanding your artist as well, right? What are they willing to do and all yeah. that good stuff? You yeah, know, totally. also, uh, one thing I will say, almost contrary to that, mm -hmm. is as we're doing this for the, you know, for the students in business, always be wary of somebody who calls you up and said, oh, it's a great opportunity. <laughs> it's a great opportunity for your artist, you know, to get heard everywhere. Oh, man. Uh, yeah. You know what, you know, question that, you know, and just, because if they say, oh, you know, and, and, you know, everything has a value. And if they come in and say, look, we've got like, you know, a couple of hundred, a couple of hundred dollars, but think of the exposure you're gonna get, <laughs> you know. If you really are legitimately going to get some exposure, then then great. But read between the lines there and see. Mm. It's not a line that we the ever really use. You know, we wouldn't kind of, we don't really say that. There are a couple of scenarios, a couple of situations where people want to do, want to, want to forward their career in a particular area and they just want to get their name on things. And in that, in that case, that's when we, we have that situation going on right now. And in that case, we say, look, budget's kind of crap, but there's a credit and, you know, and it's kind of exactly where you want to be. Do you want to do it? I know, but, you know, and they've gone, well, we're not selling them, you know, we're not trying to sell them the Kool-Aid at any point, really. You know, the, the other thing that I say, you know, if you were, if I was sitting in a manager, like an art, artist manager chair right now, take advantage of the Zoom culture right now, because, you know, before a year ago, when you thought about trying to meet with somebody, it was kind of like, hey, do you want to grab coffee? Like, it'd be cool to, you know, get together or whatever. And you didn't even think of like, either you were talking on the phone or you were emailing or you were inviting them to try to actually connect in, in person, you know, which is obviously kind of the top of the mountain if you can do it. But now people are so much more like there's people hitting us up all the time for like, hey, like, check out my stuff. Like, if you're down to do a quick Zoom, you know, I'd love that. And I'll just loop them in with, you know, what one of our production assistants and be like, cool, like, let us know what you want to, you know, I'm down, like give us a couple of windows and we'll make it happen and I'll do it. I'll just jump on zoom and we'll, you know, talk for 20 minutes or something like that. So I'd say, and, and what that does obviously is it just makes an imprint in my brain about them that I just wouldn't get if it, we were just interacting with email. Cause it's kind of feels like another email, even if the, you know, even if the music's dope, like it, it'll get where it needs to go. I'll, I'll forward it along to our library folks and it'll get in the mix, but I just won't have that imprint, you know, in the way that I will, if we sit down for 15 minutes and like, get a little face to face for a second. So and, yeah, and you've, you've it's got much easier excited. thing to do now than it used to be. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you've got us excited about one of your artists. Do you know what I mean? Without doing the big sell, you know, you've got us excited about one of your artists, just, you know, they like promise you they're going to be on time, check out the stuff and you send it over. And we're like, Oh damn, this is good stuff. You know, we need, you know, we need to, to, to use this, this person. Oh, one thing I should say as well, as we're sort of talking about inception of relationships and stuff, um, for us, quite often, usually when we're, people can say a lot of things, right? And we have a limited budget on what we can pay out in demos. So quite often, usually like the first time, we'll say, are you down to do a freebie? And don't be afraid. If you're a producer, don't be afraid of that. And as a manager, you shouldn't be offended by that because that's what we're dealing with. We, we have a finite number of safe pairs of hands so we have to put that into. And it is in that situation that we are like willing to take, um, you know, a punt on an artist and go, okay, yeah, yeah, give us a, you know, give, give us a freebie on this one. If you absolutely nail it, then great. And obviously you'll get the, that's only no demo fee. You'll obviously get the final fee if it was to win. But then moving forward, you know, if you really, uh, you know, excel in that, then you're going to be one of the first people we call next time we have a demo budget coming in and we'll be pitching on a lot of things and the opportunities will be coming in. So that's just something to be aware of that, you know, that don't, 
don't do more than at least a couple of freebies though. By that time, if somebody's come back to you for a third time, you should be getting paid a demo fee. I got one more very tactical little bit of advice for the the reach out of the the manager. Like, hey, you check out you know my artist music. If I get to the fourth track and it ain't dope, I, you've said a lot. So if you only got three that I'm gonna be knocked out of my chair by, only send three. Because if you get if I start getting down your list and it's like, oh, I see, track five is actually pretty whack and maybe a little <laughs> whacker than track four. Try the first three tracks were cool. So I see where you're at now. Like I see that you're just getting started. And that might be okay. I'm not saying that, you know, that would be the end of it for me. But like, you know, if you got two dope ones, send two. Don't send me two dope ones and three like ones that you, uh, it's kind of on the fence because it's, you know, it's very telling if, if, if I can't get down the list a little bit and it stays, it doesn't stay dope. Um, That'll taste. Just, you, you develop a, a, an ear for that on, on, on this side of the fence because you're trying to sort of, you know, separate the wheat from the chaff really quickly. So, Are you listening to songs more than 30 seconds? How much time are you? If it's great, I skip around. Yeah. I skip it's around. Really you know, I, I de- I'm 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 a skipper arounder because it's like right. I'm trying to kind of economize on time music. So for sure, I'm gonna I'm gonna check out your intro. You want you got to hit me right in the beginning. Yeah, like there's, <laughs> yeah. there's tracks where like it's <laughs> it's like yeah. some whack drum loop or something, you know. And then I'll skip <laughs> into the middle. I'm like, oh, it actually gets super dope once the keys come in or the guitar. You know what I mean? It's like don't. Make sure it's good right off the bat, and because that's you know I'm gonna listen to that, and then you know I'll skip into the hear the verse, and then I'll skip into the chorus, and kind of you know see if you're doing something dope in the bridge or something. So yeah, it's oh. I, I'm generally I, attention span does. I'm not gonna sit there and listen to the you know the whole thing unless it really catches me. I was gonna say I flick around and then, but if then I feel like a, something's cool, but I haven't got it in context, I'll have to take it back at least to get it in context and to so hear how things are developing. So. Yeah. yeah, those are all, those are all really good tactical, practical things that you can apply. Yeah, let's flip it. What if I wanted to break into music licensing as a professional, not like as a producer? I have no producer <laughs> skills. I want to. This is my passion. I want to put music to picture. It's a lifestyle choice. I can tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> um. Right. Well, you see. The thing is that within within those brackets, there, there are a few kind of positions that you can be in. So like, you know, probably music supervisor would be one of them where essentially you're a conduit for existing music. And then people think, oh, great, I get to sit on Spotify and just sort of search for great music for people's films and, ad, uh, you know, advertising. That's like... Probably time-wise, 30, 40% of it. The rest of it is then building up your contacts with publishers at record labels, getting lawyers on side so that you can then basically, if somebody goes, I really like that track, that you can then go, that's so-and-so at Universal. I keep on saying Universal. It's so-and-so at Warner's, you know, wherever. They get they own the master. Publishing's held by blah, blah, blah. You can just pick up the phone and go, hey, can you get me a quote on this for the publishing? You can a quote on this on the master license and they hit you back quick because people want stuff quickly as well. And a lot of it is that and then dealing with all the paperwork that goes along with that. So actually doing the searches is only a small part of being a music supervisor. Music supervisor. So that would be one. Jay? Yeah, I mean, this is this might come off as a little little sideways, but I'm trying to put myself back in, you know, if I was coming out of school and I was looking to get into the music business and I, maybe I wanted to get into management or A&R or, you know, or work for a publisher. What I would do honestly is I would scratch and claw to try to get an internship at a, at a marquee top level company. That's what I would do because, you know, we're, we're in the process of hiring a couple of people right now and it just, everybody's kind of a little bit of a star effort, whether you want to be or not. So when I'm looking at resumes and I'm looking where people have been, if you spent six months at Sony or you spent, you know, or you were at a big publisher or something, that's going to mean something to me. Cause then I'm going to know that you were in amongst people who were doing it at a very high level. You probably learned a, a fair amount. Um, and that's, that's huge, you know? So maybe the other, the other angle into that is you got it. And this is, this was my way. And is get whatever you do, get around people doing whatever it is that you want to do at a very high level. That's the only way you can do it. Cause I, I know for me as a starting out as a, as a producer and composer, you know, I started out of my bedroom. 
um, for the most part. And then I got, I, I scratched and clawed and got a job with a, a record producer who was working with a bunch of boy bands and stuff at the time and like really major label artists. And without that, if I, if I hadn't made that step, um, I don't know how long it would have taken me in my bedroom to learn what I learned in like a two and a half year period. I mean, I can't even tell you, you the rocket boosters that that put on my brain and my career and everything to get in rooms where people are doing it 10 times, you know, the level that I could even fathom. That's what you need to do. And so that, I'd that's say that's on every level, not just not obviously as a producer, which is also super important, but in no, just on the business side, you, anything, you want to be in. Yeah, yeah you want to be like well, the reason I say, like, go, go try to get into, you know, get an internship somewhere where they're doing it at a crazy level, because you're just going to I mean, it's been harder in the last year with COVID and everybody working remotely. But when you get in those rooms, that's how you, you you're going to hear all this crosstalk and these, hear these conversations. You're going to hear your boss negotiating with somebody and there's just no substitute for being in the crosshairs in the in the you know just hearing that stuff in the wind and, and sort of even taking it in by osmosis so whatever you got to do go go get with people who are doing it at a dope level and if you can do that at a place where you're also kind of getting a boost to your resume that's a that's a dope double whammy and that's going to be your if you're if you're smart and you're bright and you get that under your belt it's hard to stop you at that point you know yeah, that's, that's that's great advice. Yeah, yeah. I wonder if you want us to go into sort of specifics any more of jobs within sync. It it could go on a while. No, I, I think I think the music supervision, music supervisor is good. I think the internship element is is amazing. Yeah, crawl, <laughs> do whatever you got to do to open that door, yeah. put your foot through it, and then eventually kick it open. I think that that's yeah. great advice. Yeah, uh, email. I mean, that- I, I got my first job in sync at a boutique licensing company similar to yours. I mean, I emailed, I must have emailed 25, 30 different companies and one of them got back to me. And I remember during the interview, they were like, I thought it was a sync sort of paperwork admin thing. And the creative director was, oh, by the way, you're also going to be doing music editing. And I come from a DJ background. So I was like, great, that's fine with me. And he's like, do you know Pro Tools? And I was like, in my head, I didn't know Pro Tools, <laughs> but I was like, I really want this job. And I said, yes, I know Pro Tools. And then like that week, I ended up paying like $1,200 for like a weekend Pro Tools masterclass <laughs> and got enough of a sort of handle <laughs> yeah. on Pro Tools. You dirty dog, David. You dirty yeah, dog. Hey, you know, you <laughs> said, I'm taking your advice. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. you bring up, you bring up, you you kind of bring up a good point, man. And it's, again, I'm going back to my the experience right now and just the experience of hiring people in general over the, the years. Another thing that's dope, and you kind of just touched on it, like, tangential um skill sets you know especially when you're working with a smaller company it's one thing if you're going to go you know work at a huge company and you're going to kind of be in there narrow with this very siloed kind of you know system but in a company like ours we're always looking we're, we're looking for a certain core thing and then because it's a small company you're going to have to wear two other hats too so if you come in you know if we need like somebody to sit and do a and r for us and you also happen to have a sick eye as it come when it comes to graphic design hello, like now we're talking, or you can edit film or you can, you know what I mean? Or you're great with social content or whatever it might be. So to me, there's just no excuse to, you know, make yourself attractive in three different ways. And then, you know, be able to come in hot with, uh, with the primary ask and then bring some really other you know, cool complimentary skill sets is another yeah. kind of nice. That's, it, we're looking for that. And by we, I mean, anybody hiring, especially young folks, you know, Right. I feel like this is piggybacking off what David and I were talking about a moment ago before we jumped on here. So there's a certain level of, of uh, initiative and hunger. It's like, yeah, I want mm-hmm. this aspect. I want, would love to be in your position, Dan. I'd love to be in your position, Dan. Yeah. But right now, I will. what do you need me to do? And I will run full speed at that. And um, that that's always an admirable quality because I'm like, this person is looking to grow, not just uh, take, you yeah. know? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, that, exactly. that's exactly who we look for. I feel like I, it would be remiss to not sort of point out what a creative director is, as we've mentioned them a couple of times. Um, essentially, and I'm going to keep it less procrastinated than I did in regards to music supervision, but uh, yeah, a creative director in the Vegas sense is someone who will uh, put together the brief. This is within a music house capacity. We'll put together a brief for the, uh, for the composers and then give feedback, creative feedback on 
what is sent in and we'll also in putting together the brief we'll interpret what the client is wanting and what they need and sometimes there's a bunch of ambigu ambiguity in regards to what they want so creative directors will do that they have creative aspects to that and will help in the creative aspects of what's going on there then there's also the title of producer within the music house now that is very confusing for a lot of folks because what a producer will, it actually does is way more administration kind of stuff they make sure that they are the client liaison essentially with the agency or with the with the if you're direct to uh, direct to, to a brand for example they will deal with their marketing company a lot of emails a lot of making sure things get done on time making sure that people get paid and everything's registered etc cetera, etc cetera. and that's what a producer does within that environment and then also within this environment you might have in-house composers that kind of speaks for itself and there might be other admin positions etc cetera, etc cetera. but that is kind of mm. the the structure of a of a music house mm. gents I, I want to be uh aware of like your time i don't want to take too much of it um but I, I just have a couple more questions um there's obviously a lot of talk about data are you guys using data to make choices? Like, does that is that a thing for you guys, or maybe it's just one check mark and then you kind of go um, with your gut or feeling or goosebumps or anything like great, that? Great, 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 relevant question. Um, it's funny in the timing of it. It's funny because we we've used data. Like I mentioned a bit ago when we were talking about sonic branding. You know, those kind of projects in our world. It's really important that we have a set of kind of qualitative and quantitative data that we're delivering alongside our creative because the clients, you know, the stakes on, on like a sonic branding project are really high and they want to know that things are testing well and they want to know, you know, they want to have all that in front of them as they're making decisions. The day-to-day -day, um, project for us that's not sonic branding, it's more like, you know, we're creating a, a cool piece of music for a 30-second spot or, you know, that that kind of project. That's been something where we've been talking for about the last year of how can we fold in AI and data into that process? Because I think client, our clients are becoming more interested in having these data sets delivered alongside the creative. So they can look a lot, a lot of times we'll deliver creative and, you know, somebody at the brand has a certain idea for what track they think should be, be the one that goes final. And then somebody at the agency has a different idea and there's this wrestling match and, and all of it is just completely based on gut, which is fine. I mean, that's, there's nothing wrong with that. But if you can also provide some empirical evidence alongside that, <clears throat> maybe it clears up that that wrestling match or it, it acts as a bit of a referee or it just informs, or, you know, whatever it might be. So we actually, the reason your your question's sort of poignant timing wise is we've been working with uh, TikTok directly, TikTok Bike Dance on like a lot of brand challenges, which is a really interesting sort of type of uh, work for us because it, it kind of hits us at our sweet spot because it's they just want us to make records. They just want things that are dope. You know, it's not like about being subservient to a visual visual necessarily. It's just like, you know, there is no visual. They're going to seed our track into TikTok and pay influencers to, you know, go and see the challenge and see the trend and all that kind of stuff. So we've been able to do some really cool stuff, but we just delivered on a project yesterday, I want to say, yesterday, day before yesterday, where for the first time on more of our day-to-day -day projects like this, we delivered a data set along with the creative when we delivered our creative. Um, I think that's going to be more and more where things go. And I think it will get to a point where you will, ex if you're dealing with music at all, you're going to, you know how like um, you're, you're browsing Netflix and it tells you 98% match, 96% match. That's going to be how everything is, including music and, 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 and the way people think about music for media and how music supervisors think about how they're placing different pieces of music on media or on a visual, on a spot or whatever it might be. Like, that's just going to be wrapped up in the way that you even like search platforms. It might be Spotify. It could be more, you know, kind of industry based. Um, just, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Disco, the, the service, but I think all of these measurement type tools are going to be uh, right alongside all of those, you know, platforms at some point. It's going to be second nature. You're going to be like, oh, yeah, it used to be like you just used to have to listen to things and have an idea, you know, so there's always going to be, you know, the ears are always going to come first, but this kind of data is just going to be second nature to us. I think maybe sooner than later. I mean, you know, five years from now, it could be it completely expected by every one of our clients that we deliver that kind of data alongside every piece of creative that we deliver. Cool. 
Amazing. The cool thing is, is that as time goes by as well, you can get more and more accurate and more and more precise data as you enter more data mm -hmm. into your database in regards to feedback and people's reactions, et cetera, et cetera, yeah. and what's worked and what hasn't, even just from our side. And we, if we can get data from our, you know, uh, our other quantitative suppliers, um, you know, you can get an incredible sort of oversight on what really works in a particular brand area, you know, yeah. or in a particular time frame on a particular media, you know, this is going to be. We've, yeah, we've yeah. embraced it, but I think, you know, for most people, there's some people who we talked to about that, like TikTok was a great example. When we first, we've only had a relationship with them directly for about three or four months. And when we first <clears> met with that team, we talked about this with them a little bit because we'd already, you know, started using it and started thinking about it. I'd written some articles about AI and data and music a few months ago and late, late last year. And so we kind of had the conversation like, hey, do you think this is something your clients might dig, your brand clients? And their their eyes just lit up because they were like, yes, I think they would totally love this. Other people we talked to about this, they're kind of like, no, nah, man, I like, I'm just vibey. I want to listen. I just want to listen. I want to hear, you know, I just want it. I, I no, I, I don't want that at all. Like, keep it away from me. You know, like, yeah. I hope the robots never come to kill us or whatever, you know, they might do. Um, so we kind of have to, we have to, we have to read the room right now because it's not like this has, you know, been completely adopted on our side of the business or really any side of music at this point. But I just kind of tell people, look, I, I've started, I'm, I've been curious about it. I've been learning about it. We've started to learn how to integrate it because it's coming whether you like it or not at some point. And I just want to know how to use it best and how to like shake hands with the robots and give them a hug maybe as opposed to them, like, you know, <laughs> reaching right for the sword or whatever. Cause I think there's a way that we can hang together for a little bit and work together. And, you know, um, so that, that's kind of our attitude is just trying to be out on the edge of this a little bit and, and to yeah. not be surprised by its onset, you know, when it, when it really hits. Amazing. My, my last question is how cool was it to work on a Super Bowl commercial? Mm. <laughs> it all depends on which Super Bowl commercial. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, you know, the, the interesting part of that is it's, it, when, when we're working on them, sometimes they don't feel different to anything else. Usually it's a good piece of work, you know, um, which, which is always nice to work on, but <clears throat> it, it, it is, it's always the aftermath, you know, like we, the, we had a, a really great one this past, we had, we had worked on a couple of Super Bowl spots in this, this past Super Bowl. Um, one was a music supervision job for Robin Hood and the other one was a, a original music job for Toyota. And Which the Toyota one- was not being a Super Bowl spot. Yeah, exactly. But it, yeah. it was a fantastic piece of music and it was great that they ended up using it in that because we, yeah. we at Surrey J, I completely jumped in there, but I got excited. We yeah, ended up no. putting an orchestra for it. And, yeah. yeah. It was super cool, but it was, I got to say, you know, the nature of that one, we didn't necessarily see it coming. We knew it was a good piece. We knew it was a good spot and it really tugged the heartstrings. But that was one of those times where something just kind of took off in a way that we couldn't foresee because it, that, that it was such an emotional spot um, yeah. that it, you know, a lot of people took to it. It ended up being like the number one on a lot of the Super Bowl lists and, and all that stuff. And and there was this one post I saw, it was about the, 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 person featured in the spot is in a Paralympian and she's one of the most decorated, you know, Paralympic swimmer, swimmers of all time. Just, I don't even know how many medals, but just a crazy story. She was adopted as a, as a kid and she's from Siberia originally. Um, and so there was this one social post that, that people started posting about in the aftermath of the spot. And it was this little girl who was, it was a picture of her, this little, probably two or three years old. She has little crutches, you know, holding her up. And this is a picture of her from behind and she's watching TV and she's watching the spot. And I guess when the spot came on, she saw this woman who was a swimmer and didn't, doesn't have legs. And she, you know, she, the little girl crawls over to get her crutches and she kind of, you know, stands up on them. And this is what the mom is sort of captioning in the thing. And she's like, you know, she, she, she looks like me, you know, I, I want to, I want to be like her when I grow up kind of thing. And it was just like, that just cut right through me. You have, you have to see that if you saw a picture and you heard this story, you'd be like, Oh Lord. Um, yeah. But that was just one of those ones where it's like, Oh my gosh, you know, it, it was, it was a good reminder, the reach of the Super Bowl, if it hits, you know, intersects in a certain way, like this one did this Toyota one, you know, that it just, it amplifies the effect of whatever's going on with that piece of media in a way that, you know, a little girl like that would, you know, seize it and it, it just sort of reverberates and there's all these cool stories of people being actually touched by these types of pieces of work that have heart and have soul, you know, so that was a good example.
of that. That's a little bit of a tangential answer to your <clears throat> question. We worked on a lot of different Super Bowl spots over the year, but th there was actually what, something amazingly special about this, you know, this one uh, in this last Super Bowl. It was a really great track as well. The music was fantastic. It was beautiful. Yeah, it was. Yeah. It was nice that we were able to go in a studio and record it, and we, you know, live piano literally, and live strings, and you know, yeah, literally two weeks before everything got locked down. So, wow. Well, yeah. So we just caught it. We like we were we were recording in there, and we were at the phase where oh, we can't shake hands. Everyone's got a fist bump. That's where we were at uh -huh. at that time. And so yeah, yeah we all sat in the room and uh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. I got one last human question real quick. Uh, what are you all listening to lately? Just for your own, your own enjoyment. Oh, oh man. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a, hold on a minute. I have to crack open Spotify here. Well, I got, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll oh. cop out for a second and say that I, this, this ties in to, to, to who our audience is here today, but I listen to a ton of business podcasts. I know that's not the nature of your, your question, Aaron, that's but, so good. um, you know, that's, <laughs> A big part of my journey, yeah, I, I spent a lot of years, obviously, in the first part of my career, waking up every day to try to write the best piece of music I could, you know, and then over the past probably six or seven years as the company evolved and grew and <clears throat> my focus shifted, you know, to creating the best business I can create, basically. So, you know, I spent a ton of time um, listening. There's, that's the cool thing about, you know, people who are interested in business, music, business. Uh, there's so many dope resources podcasts, YouTube, you know, where you can just get really keyed in on some great principles and some dope motivation and all that stuff. So anyway, that's my initial cop out answer to, to what am I listening to? <laughs> well, well, who are, give me, give me one of those podcasts. You know what? A lot of people don't like this dude, but Gary V has some pretty amazing things to say. Yeah. He, he gets Always. me fired up. Yeah. There's a dude named, um, Grant Cardone, which is sort of, he's another sort of goofball, crazy motivator guy. Um, there's a, there's a, a amazing podcast called masters of scale from the dude, one of the co-founders of LinkedIn, I, I eat that thing up it has a really cool, uh, kind of entertainment value alongside just, um, they have amazing people on there who talk about origin stories of their companies and, you know, mm -hmm. struggles and trials and tribulations and building a company and all that stuff. And I just eat that stuff up. And it's, it, like I say, it's really, it's, it's affected our, you know, our growth in our company. I mean, there's a lot, there's a ton of stuff that I've learned in, in that. I mean, you can give yourself a little master's and PhD in business. You really can, you know? Um, so yeah, okay. that's a couple. Yeah. Jay, along those lines, uh, A16Z from Andreessen Horowitz is amazing as well. Ah, okay. You might have to shoot me an email. I will. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I appreciate that. That's cool. It's Dan, so funny, you take the music part. I've got, well, I've actually, I was going to, I was going to addendum what you said. I've moved more away from them and I started getting more kind of holistic in general to what I was listening to right the way to the point. Now I'm listening to a podcast called Massive Failures in like all of the, all of the businesses that were huge and ended up collapsing. And I just wanted to get an insight <laughs> That's cool. onto the other side as to how, how things kind of fell apart. And then I might treat myself to a bit of true crime occasionally. And then okay. like, uh, and then, but music wise, I'm just looking at recent stuff I added to the general sort of playlist. This is going back a little bit, but uh, Time Alone With You, Jacob Collier, uh, All About You, again, by The Knox. <clears throat> I totally, we got sent this as a ref and I, for some reason I love it. Um, it's called, uh, the Doc Bocky by Bauer and Omega Sapien. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. And then uh, Rain Capricorn. Oh, and I love this. Uh, Louis Vega, Let It Go with Marky Bassey. That's a true. Yeah. It's going back to my house roots right there. Let so. me answer real quick, just so I'm not whack and I don't completely cop out. So <laughs> honestly, the, a lot of what I've been listening to is coming out of um, something we do with our projects where we get a pro We've been doing this recently, especially with a lot of TikTok projects we've been doing get a project in it's a certain genre it's a certain style we'll go and and hunt on spotify for dope artists who we can potentially pull in yeah to work on those projects and i mean like dope art you know like i mean we're not calling the weekend or whatever but i mean it's you know we we can kind of take a couple steps down from there and a lot of times depending on the budget and the terms and the turnaround we can get some great folks on it um so there's a lot you know like there's one we've been doing a lot of kind of soulful hip-hop projects in the last there was a lot of black history month we did a lot of that kind of stuff so there's this dude named maxwell who's super dope that i love um yeah. listening maxwell, to him a lot. Like, maxwell 
MMX, MXX, WLL. Yeah. Okay, cool. That dude is sick if you haven't checked him out. Oh, um, he's so good. You gotta, yeah, you must check him out. He is, yeah. Great. He does some great YouTube videos as well. Potato great. Head People. There's a dude named Obliv, a guy named Cartoons. Yeah. yeah. Coming across these amazing, you know, just super. Sort of jazzy, sort of hip hop, but not too, you know, not too Miles Davis. And yeah, that's all kind of get, soulful. I don't want to get into the. Yeah, it's just yeah. soulful, but with a jazz, you know, there are people who feel very passionately about Miles Davis. So I'm not going to touch it too much. Anyway, <laughs> there, I did it. Man. You happy, Aaron? Yeah. <laughs> Put me on the spot. I got you. Both. Got me. <laughs> uh well thank you guys i really appreciate you being here this is this was an amazing conversation a lot of facts a lot of facts mm. awesome yeah. thank you guys for having us yeah thank you very yeah. much absolute pleasure i'm sure we'll see each other again soon yeah for sure absolutely please.